yeah, I'm going to talk about my project. It's Alpha 2048. Of course, that's the pun on AlphaGo. And um, so usually I'm speaking at JavaScript conferences about machine learning. So this is the first time I'm going to speak at a machine learning conference about JavaScript. So let's see how this works out. Um, first, a short few st uh, things about myself. Um, that's me. I'm, you can follow me on Twitter, on GitHub. I, I'm also on some unknown social network things called Google+, Plus, but I rarely look into it, so probably not the best way to contact me. Um, I'm a software developer at a company called Datenfreunde. We are just basically on like the intersection between journalism and data. It's not that interesting. I'm not going to talk about my company today. But I'm also a machine learning enthusiast, is what I call myself. Um, so this project I'm going to be telling you about is what I did in my free time, mostly. All right, let's just get right ahead. So this, um, this game, 2048, I don't know if you've heard about it. Um, there was this original game called Threes, and it looked kind of like this GIF. That's a promotional GIF for Threes. And the goal is basically to match uh, multiples of three or two and one. And when you match them, then you get the sum of those tiles as new tile. And I guess the goal is to play as long as you can. But then after they brought it out, as it often is in the tech um, business, uh, there were a lot of clones. So most of them were based on 2048 because there was a clone uh, that was open sourced. And there were also some kind of weird clones, like this dog kind of thing. I guess it makes it a bit harder because you don't know when you match two dogs, which is the new dog you're going to get. But anyway, people loved it and people played it. So yeah, that's fine. Um, so I'm going to be focusing on the original on the original clone, which was uh, 2048, because it's open source and it's also JavaScript. And as I said, I like JavaScript. Basically, you can Google it. Um, there's a um, there's a clone on GitHub, um, which you can just use for your own projects. Um, so yeah, let's uh, go through the rules real quick, so we are all on the same page. Um, we start with a 4x4 grid, or we play on a 4x4 grid. And um, each turn, you can take an action, which I call alpha. And alpha is one of the four possible actions. Um, it's up, down, left, and right. And uh, in this particular implementation, it will be mapped to 0, 1, 2, or 3. Then um, if you merge two tiles with the same value, with the value v, you get one tile. So they merge into one tile. And that tile has the value 2v, or two times the old value. And after this action is completed, if you merge something or not, um, a new tile is added to an empty space. And in this particular implementation, um, you have a 90% chance of, it, of the new value being 2 and a 10% chance of it being 4. So over time, your board will just grow full, fuller and fuller. You can lose at the game, uh, usually when you uh, have no more moves that are possible. So if your board is completely full and you can't move or merge anything anymore, then you lose the game. You can also win the game. And uh, you win when you have one tile present with the value of 2048. But you can also keep on playing as long as you want if you manage to get there. I Personally, I never did. Um, and there's also a score. And the way the score is calculated is that every time you merge two tiles, then the sum of those tiles are added to the score. So every time you merge something, then you, uh, your um, score gets updated pertaining to the value of the tiles you merged. All right, so alpha 2048. So this was my idea of if I'm not able to actually win at this game, maybe I can teach my computer to do it and then just tell everyone that I, of course, did it myself. And um, so there were a few constraints. The first one was it had to be JavaScript. It didn't necessarily have to be JavaScript, but for my prototype, I started with it. Uh, one thing was that the implementation is in JavaScript and it runs in the browser. The other thing is that this is my home tech stack and I'm just, I, I just get it to run and set up really quickly and I don't have to um, take care of so many other things. Um, the other um, constraint was that it had to be supervised learning. That kind of makes sense because we know where we want to go, we know what's good, what's not that good, and so it just makes sense to, to um, use supervised learning for that. So um, there's this nice handy little um, machine learning library called Synaptic. And it's, it's a neural network library for JavaScript. It's 
pretty simple. You can get into it um, very easily. And um, it, it does, among other things, classification, which is nice, which we can use. And also, um, I, I personally have some prior experience with it. I set up a small project where I tried to predict the, the results from soccer scores, and I used Synaptic for that, so I already knew how to use it. All right, um, so the first thing I wanted to do, of course, is gather data. So how was I going to gather the data? Um, the idea was to take every state for itself, so every move, and then simulate all possible actions that you can take from that state, and then check whether the score would increase if I took that action. And then, in the end, I'm going to take a random move. I could have just taken one of the moves that would increase my score, so would I well, would have matched something, but I wanted to check where, how it would behave with completely random moving around the board, randomly moving around the board. So in this case, I just um, picked the random move and, and um, took that action. All right, this is how um, a data set would look uh, in this in this example, so I have a board state. It's a serialized, so it's one-dimensional. So it's, uh, it's the board, and every empty space is a zero, and every space with the value of the tile has the value of the tile. And then the actions are basically mapped. So for in this example, um, if I took the action one or three, the score would increase, and if I took the action zero or two, the score wouldn't have increased. So I gathered, I played like a hundred games maybe, and uh, took that data. It was a little bit, it wasn't enough, but I just wanted to try it. And uh, so the next iteration was basically to check how that would behave or compared to a trained network. And so the first step, of course, is to train my neural network. Like I said, I did it with this classification library, not that interesting. But um, I wanted it to predict whether the score would increase for particular um, actions that could have been taken. And uh, then I would have moved where the probability of the score increasing was the highest. Right, that's pretty straightforward, I guess. I, can, I think everyone can understand what my, what my thinking there was. And, but in conclusion, I'm not going to bore you with the details of the data. Uh, it did not work great. Unsurprisingly, it wasn't that great. Um, one problem was that it will only emulate the strategy that I gave him, and there was no strategy because I basically just moved around randomly, and so there was no particular thing for the for the um, like there was no long-term strategy for the machine to learn, and so that's why I thought, okay, maybe I need something that has more foresight that does not evaluate each state for itself, but can look into like the future to the end of the game. So I. Googled, like, like any good researcher do, does, I, I googled, and I have came across this thing that's called reinforcement learning. I hope, or I think you've heard of it of, as well. Um, so reinforcement learning, it takes a state, in this case there's another board state, and then it will map one of the possible actions, and for this combination of state and action, it will want to get a reward for it. So we have a state, we have an action, and we pair that, and we, get a, we give the system or the machine a reward for the state and action pair. That's the idea, and that is pretty much what I needed and what I wanted for my problem. So yeah, I was thinking, okay, great. Um, there are two other things that reinforcement learning can do, or can handle. The one thing is delayed rewards. So that means that you don't have to reward the system for each action, but you can reward it at the end of the game, for example, which is nice because now my machine knows about the series, that there are episodes and a series of episodes that all combined will lead to a reward in the end. So now I have my foresight. And the other thing that we have to think of and deal with with reinforcement learning is um, exploration versus exploitation. And what that means is um, while you want the system, so f first of all, I don't create data for the system to learn, but the system will learn by itself and create data itself while it learns and plays the game. And while at the 
one hand, I want the system to do what it knows is working and where it gets the highest reward. At the same time, the system also needs to explore other avenues so we will have more experience to learn from. So we kind of have to see how to balance exploration versus exploitation to get the best possible scenario for our game. Um, so this is reinforcement learning. There's another like principle that takes it even further, which is called temporal difference learning. And I'm not going to go too deeply into that, just two things. Um, it uses dynamic programming. It's not that interesting, it just basically says that we divide our bigger problem into sub-problems. And the other more interesting thing is that it uses the Monte Carlo methods. And uh, Monte Carlo method or Monte Carlo tree is basically a decision tree. So you have like a big decision tree where you go from one state and you take the actions and then you have new states and then you have actions there. And at the end of your tree, you have rewards. So this is a heuristic search tree basically. And um, if the Monte Carlo tree basically does not know about your state, for now, it will just approximate by taking a similar state that it already knows about or a similar state action pair that it already knows about and go, yeah, well, I don't know this exact state, but I know a, a similar one and I got a really good reward for that action, so I'm just going to take this action. Right, so um, those are the, theoretic, the, the theories behind it and let's just see how it worked out. Um, all right. There is a reinforcement library in JavaScript, which is great because then I could still use JavaScript for it. And also it runs in the browser, so there's stuff to see, which is always good. Um, and reinforce.js is, um, is a library which makes it very simple to actually do reinforcement learning because basically you only need four lines of code, more or less. Um, you have a state, and this state um, is again, serialized, it has to be one-dimensional, unfortunately. And you get an agent from the library itself, and then you tell the agent, okay, I'll give you the state, and tell me what action you want to take when you get the state. So we, take, we get an action, which is an integer, and then we do something with that action. In our case, we will feed it to our game and take the action and then simulate the move. And then we need to calculate a reward. So we have to somehow think of a value, how to um, reward this action. And then we tell the agent, hey, this is the numerical reward, learn from it. Now in this example, of course, I'm, I'm rewarding every single action, but I, don't, but I don't have to. Like I said, I can take a lot of actions before giving my agent a reward. So basically, everything comes down to the reward function. In this case, um, the function is called Q because it uses um, an algorithm that's called Q-learning. Again, I'm not going to go into, uh, too deeply into that, but it, it is supposed to work. So the Reinforce.js is based on a paper where some guy, I forget his name, he taught his computer to play Atari games with Q-learning. So, yeah, okay, this, is, this, this seems to be working, all right, and I'm just going to try what other people have tried before. So, like I said, um, our job now becomes what is the best reward function? What is the best way to reward our um, machine by, by giving it a state and action? So in the first iteration, I just tried the most simplest thing that I like, could think of um, that was to be the reward should be the score at the end of the game. So I don't have to really do anything myself. I just do what I, we'll just give it whatever I already have. And so, okay, this is the, the graph. Um, it's not, we can't really see very much, so we, let's just look at the average. So this is the average score, uh, so the end score of the games over time. And as you can see, it doesn't really, there's nothing really to see, it doesn't really do that much, it probably didn't learn anything, and it was kind of disappointing. But, okay, now I knew, maybe just giving it the score wasn't, a good, wasn't as good of an idea as I thought it was, let's try different things. I tried a lot of different things. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them. Let's just say I found something that seemed to work fine, which was a normalized score multiplied with a normalized number of moves. Because I was thinking, well, if you have like a high score, that's good. You want to reward that. But you maybe also want to reward um, the system for playing a really long game, because that's also pretty good. So that seemed to work OK. So I used that uh, for the future, but that's not what I want to focus of, uh, on. Um, 
what I do want to focus on is what I did for my second iteration, and that was um, decaying epsilon over time. So epsilon is a metaparameter that I can give my, um, my, my agent, and epsilon defines how high your exploration value is. So like I said before, I want my system to try different things, but also take the action that it knows is the best for it. Um, so in, in the documentation of the library, it was recommended to decay your epsilon over time. So it's like, yeah, that sounds plausible. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. Um, so every thousand games or so, I'm reducing the value of epsilon. And then let's see how that worked out. In a very optimistic reading, we could say that there is some kind of like upwards kind of trend thingy, but it's, uh, it's, it's very optimistic. I'm not entirely sure whether I would go to someone and say, look, it works with uh, that kind of graph. But still, you know, it was like, okay, this might be working. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use it for the next iteration and just see how it, all those things that seem to work multiply in the end. So, okay, I'm going to go to the third iteration which, of course, is always the most interesting one, because three is a magical number. Um, in the third iteration, I added a hidden layer. So in Reinforced.js, when you <laughs> buy it from the store, um, it has one hidden layer hard-coded, and that is not, like, it doesn't work really well. And it's not that easy to add, like, any number of hidden layers, but I managed to get another hidden layer, so I got two. Um, yeah, let's just see how it works. I mean, you don't have to reinvent the wheel and, uh, and work your way through the end of things if you don't know whether it will actually benefit you. Okay, so I added a hidden layer. Let's see. So th there's a gap uh, in there because my computer was a bit slow at the time, but just ignore that, not important. Oh, look! I think it, you can say that there is an upwards trend. So it's, like I said, again, it's, it's, it's optimistic, but it's not as it was before. It's, it's, it looks more like, okay, there is, um, there is a learning trend. There's an upwards trend. Um, so I did run it even longer, and I run, ran, ran the uh, simulation over a few days. But it is, there is a cap. And um, I'm going to talk about it right now, but it, like this is this is the best part of the curve, right? This is like the, the most beautiful thing. So I wanted to show you this. Um, all right. Um, so, if we, uh, in conclusion, for this particular library and this particular problem, it's, there seems to be a learning. Uh, there seems to be some kinds of upwards trend, which is nice, but. Um, so there's this problem with the board size. So the board size is four by four, and um, it just caps at some point because you need a lot of values lying there already to be able to merge them with other tiles. And at some point, it just gets really full and really crowded, and you just you just it, it gets really hard. And apparently, our system is not as clever to be able to jump over this particular obstacle. Um, the other problem is that our input is flat. It's one dimensional and but the board is two-dimensional, so maybe there is some kind of implication that the system doesn't really get because it's one-dimensional. And um, this is mostly of the, the everything I want to talk about, so let's, let's have a look at how it looks like. So on the left, there's the random moves, and as you can see, it just moves around in every single direction. It does do a lot of matches, and also, um, at some point, the game kind of forces you to make the correct move because if you move around left and right, nothing happens. It will just at some point move up and down and then it will get the correct match. And now this is the um, trained model. Okay, and this looks like it just stops at some point, but in reality, it tries to move like down or to the right and nothing happens. So what you can interpret from it is that it learns that it's better to play the game when you move everything to one corner. And if one corner doesn't work, work move it to the other corner. But um, it's not like moving around as much anymore. But it also means that at the beginning, you don't do as many matches. And it doesn't, at first it looks like it doesn't really, is, it isn't really able to play the game, but over a few hours, it seems to do better than the random thing. So yeah, um, that's basically all I have to say about it. If you think that this is interesting, um, try it yourself. It's really cool. The hardest thing of working on 2048 is not to get distracted by playing it all the time. That's the hardest uh, thing of the game. 
So yeah, thank you. <laughs>